Hey guys, The Naturberg here. Hope you're doing well. So in this video, we will be discussing security again. Recently, I made a video how to protect your marketing against hackers, but it's come up again that some new CVEs has come out over the last couple of weeks. Well, one specific CV actually, namely CVE 2023-30799, and it is a CVE that where people needs to have admin access on a router already, but it gives them a way of escalating that access from just being a normal administrator to being a super user, which is in essence giving them a way to get onto the back end of the marketing system itself. It's kind of like being on the Linux operating system itself, where they can run some very sketchy code and things that really shouldn't be happening. So this video will just be bringing the CVE to light a little bit, and we'll also be looking at ways how to mitigate access on your marketing and to protect against the CVE in general. So I hope you enjoy. All right, so let's start off the video just by talking about CVEs in general. So what is a CVE? I just want you to think of it as a ID or a reference to a vulnerability that exists and it becomes publicized basically. It becomes documented and it's in a database somewhere. And you can actually go and look at the CVE and see what it was or what it is and how people figured it out and possibly also how to fix the CVEs. But just having a CVE up on a database somewhere does not mean that the vulnerabilities do not exist. I can promise you there are tons of vulnerabilities that don't have any CVEs that nobody knows about that people are using bad actors to exploit networks and servers and devices and everything. And that's the scary bit. But luckily, we have people like security research companies and security minded individuals and cybersecurity guys and network vendors and everybody working together to create stuff like these databases so that the researchers can get out to the vendors and tell them, hey, we found this issue. Vendors can then patch the issue and then the CVE gets published. And that means that all that we technically need to do to get rid of whatever issues we were having with the vulnerability is just to patch our systems. But many people aren't that clued up with these things and they're not sure what CVEs are. So I just quickly wanted to run through it. But if we look at Microtech CVE specifically, I'm going to search the CVE list quickly and I can just type in here Microtech and this will give us a list of all of the Microtech vulnerabilities that have been published over the years. And as you can see, there has been quite a few. If you look at the CVE list, it's CVE dash, then it's the year the CVE was published or the ID was created for it. So 2023, we've only had two vulnerabilities so far, and then we have the actual ID code for it. Now our latest one is 30799. And this is a very special one because it has made some waves over the last few weeks. It's not the worst vulnerability out there because it does require authentication, meaning an attacker or bad actor actually already needs to have access on your marketing as an administrator. So if they've already got that access, that means you've already got big issues and them getting to the sub, like the file system or the back end of Routrace, even though that is still very, very bad and shouldn't be something that's possible, they need to be able to authenticate. So as long as you follow some best practice security steps and such, you shouldn't be affected by vulnerability by this. But the crazy part is the researchers that actually did the study, actually did a few tests, checked around on the net, and they guess that there could be or estimate there could be between 500 to 900,000 vulnerable routers in the wild. And this means this is because people like a home user, if I was never in IT and I never did any networking or anything, I was just a normal home person. Many people, they just buy the devices. They'll do some very basic setup on it by reading through a leaflet or a documentation, but they're not going to be security minded or something. These are just people that want to get their home network or their televisions or their fridges or whatever on the internet so that they can just use this stuff. So the last thing they worry about is logging in as the, the administrator and then setting default passwords or creating new admin accounts or checking out the firewall rules or stuff like that. Their first priority is internet, and then that's where it ends because it's such an ease of access for them to just have it as admin and blank. And that was RouterOS's default for a very long time. I think only last year they changed it where you had to set a password when you logged into the device, but you could also just escape out of that or you could even set it to a very simple password, something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and stuff like that gets brute forced very easily if your device is reachable on the internet. Now let's look a bit more into the CVE itself. So I'm just going to click on here and this gives us all of the reference material, a little short description, but I want to actually go to the site where it was 
publicized or where it was actually made more publicly aware, and that is on Volncheck. So this is part of the people that actually did the research and figured everything out and published this article on their blog. And if we read through the article itself, the crazy bit for me is the CVE was first disclosed without a CVE, so without an ID, so they they knew how to expose or use the vulnerability, but there was nothing like official about it yet in June 2022. Now that is over a year ago that people could do stuff like this already. And it's only recently been patched out or ironed out. And <laughs> that that's actually crazy to me. I just want to read through some of these bits, but here we can see there is some of their information about how many routers are exposed available on the internet. And you can find this data on a site called Shodan as well. So you can go to showdown.io, type in MyCritic in there, and it will give you some more information about the devices. But if we go down, we can see here it does say that authentication is required, but it is still dangerous. You can read more about the vulnerability here and how everything works. But <laughs> it's crazy that it's such an easy thing to do with stuff like brute forcing. But I want to make sure you understand it's not the end of the world. There is ways to mitigate an attack like this, and I will walk you through that as well. But I also highly encourage stuff like going through materials again, like on my own channel, I've gone through the firewall rules multiple times. I've made a video on securing a router. I know Microtix made some videos with firewall rules and even Druvis from Microtix also made a video about protecting against brute force attacks. Highly suggest watching that. I will put that information in the pinned comment, but just something to take note of. If we look at Microtix blog itself, you'll see they also word it out a little bit different, but they make sure people understand that you first need to be logged in as an administrator and it's not the biggest concern for Microtech themselves. It's still a big issue, but they did patch it out, they did fix it. So clearly the quickest and easiest way to fix this is just to upgrade your Router OS firmware. Now that brings me to the more tutorial side of the video. Let's quickly discuss the basics of how we can protect against an attack like this and similar attacks just by restricting how we can access the device, who can access the device, and where the device can be accessed from. So I'm gonna jump into Winbox for this part of the tutorial. Let's say this is a first time setup. I, I saw somebody on Reddit actually make a post. Hey, they think they might be linked to the CVE and this is the issue. So let's say you are a consumer user and this is the first thing you want to be security conscious about when you set up your device. So let's say the device doesn't even have internet yet. What are we first going to do? So I'm actually just going to disconnect from the device again, and we're gonna go through everything step by step. So let's say I access the device, admin, blank, even though I do have a password here, let's just imagine, but I'll connect on the MAC address firstly. We open this up with Moonbox, and then the first thing I would recommend is we will disable the admin account, but not just out of the box. Firstly, we create a new administrator account that we can use, because if you're not fully aware of how stuff like brute forcing works, the brute force program will typically use a well-known user account like admin, which is the default for router OS. So if you create a new admin account, it's already going to have to also try and figure out a username plus a password. And that is extremely complex. So first things first, we just go into our system and users. And then from the users, let me just delete my old user that I usually also use to connect with. So you've got a default admin account. So I would recommend add a new administrator account make it your own name or make it something unique, but make sure you know what this is because you're gonna to have to use this to log in from now on. So I might make this network Berg. I'll set the group to full, so it is a full admin account. And here we can also set stuff like the allowed addresses, which is good practice as well because this might be from specific LAN subnets that you only want to be able to access with this account. But let's leave the allowed from addresses out for now because we're a first time user or this is the first setup we do with our marketing. So let's set a password, make sure you set a password. I would recommend at least 10 characters around and also use some uppercase, lowercase and some special characters. If you don't know what a special character is, that's like at or hash or whatever. So I'll just set a password quickly. And then we can just apply this. And now we've got Network Berg having an admin account. Now, I still do not recommend disabling the admin account because what if you try and log in again and you can't, then you're going to have an issue. So let's just disconnect and let's reconnect with Network Berg and whatever password I have set. Let's connect. 
And now that I can access the device with Network Berg, I know it is actually safe to disable this admin account. So I will go ahead and just disable it. Reason I want to disable it is so that people cannot use the admin account to authenticate. I think you can maybe delete it as well. There we go. So I've deleted it as well. Now it means that somebody needs to know that the username is Network Berg to access this device. And that's going to be difficult unless you watch the channel, of course, but I'm going <laughs> to create a different account after this video as well. But at least now we have one way of protecting in a very default state so that people can't just access the device. Now with Microtik, many times it also comes with a default firewall rule, which is what my Microtik is running on. This is my HAB AX3 that I did a review on a while ago. So if we look at the firewall rule, there are some base firewall rules here. And one of the important rules is there is a rule that says drop all traffic not coming from LAN. So if we look at this rule itself, it says any traffic that wants to try and connect on the Microtik that's not in the LAN interface list, we're going to drop that access. So this means, this is why they recommend that when you buy your Microtik, that you connect on port two to whatever upwards, because typically port one or ether one is reserved for your WAN. And then you connect your WAN in there. And this technically should mean that people from the outside can't just connect on the router because the in input chain has been set to block that traffic. But there's a few ways to tweak this if you want to be 100% sure that people can't just access the device. And that might be to define stuff like management networks as well, because maybe you only want certain ranges or IP addresses or devices or stuff to access the Microtik. So you could, in essence, either only connect from your LAN range. Don't worry about this back to home stuff. This is something we'll talk about later on. But let's just say we have got a bridge interface, which is all of my LAN interfaces, Ether 2 to 5. If I double click this, maybe I want this to, you could have your LAN network to be your management network. That's totally fine. Some people do that. But you also maybe have people that create a different VLAN or they define a specific interface for management so that only management can be accessed from that specific interface. But let's just leave this very straightforward. Let's just say it's from this LAN address. It's the only address that I want people to access the management ports from. So how can I get the management ports? Well, if I go to my IP and services quickly, which is another big tip, we can see here what the ports are, which VRFs they are a part of, and where they are available from as well. So this is kind of like a, a semi-firewall rule where you can set available from, so which subnets can actually access these management ports. But first thing, with the IP services, I highly recommend you disable any service you do not use. So make sure if you don't use API, disable it. FTP, disable it. Telnet, disable it. Webfig, the dub dub dub. Disable that stuff. I'm not going to use it. I'll use SSH and Winbox. Now, <laughs> this is where stuff gets a little bit spicy because if you've looked at the CVE list itself, many of the attack vectors for Microtik is typically stemming from Winbox itself, Winbox or Webfig. Like this vulnerability, this new one, it's also requiring Winbox or webfig in order to abuse the system. So if you are also just using SSH, you won't have any issue. So we could disable Winbox, but it means that we cannot use Winbox to administrate the device anymore. But we could restrict the access for this as well, just to make sure that only the LAN subnet or the management network can access these service ports. So let's say SSH, I only want accessible from my LAN range but you can add additional ranges as you require. You can just click on this down arrow and add any additional subnets or networks that you want to access this device on the management port. So let me apply that. And I'll do the same for my Winbox. So I'll say only my network, my LAN network can access these ports. One step closer already. Now the second step is, and this might seem a bit redundant, is actually using your firewall rules. So if I go back to my firewall rules, I can create a new filter rule and I can use the chain as input. And again, this is not a comprehensive guide on how these rules function. I will put links in the pinned comment for that. This is just a quick to get you up and running if you're a new user setting this stuff up. So we can set an input chain. I can say any traffic coming from my LAN network, or let's say not coming from my LAN network, so I'll say anything, if you click on this little box, this little exclamation means anything that is not this. 
and we can also set our protocol. I'll use that as TCP. And then my destination ports will be 22. And then also the Winbox port, which I'll just quickly get. And I'm just making a separation with a, a comma there. So if you look at my IP services, 8291 is the Winbox port, so 8291. And we can set our in interface as well. So this is actually also pretty nice, but I'm just going to do this for everything. So any TCP traffic on these ports that is not my LAN subnet, I'm just going to drop that. So this is a very basic firewall rule. I'll apply this rule, scroll down, then we can just drag this rule to the very top so that it's referenced first. And now what this in essence will do is if anything other than my management network tries to connect on these ports, it just will not work. So people will not be able to just get in here and cause issues and havoc and, you know, do whatever they want to do. Now they need to be from my LAN range and it's only these secured ports that I'm using. But if you wanted to and you don't want to use Winbox, then just go SSH. It's totally fine. You can also set up stuff like RSA key pairs uh, where I've made a video on that. Microsix also made a video on that. Then you can use that specifically for authentication between your marketing and client, then you don't even need to know a password because you're going to use a certificate to connect securely between two devices. But this is just one way to quickly get you going. So now we've restricted access from which sources can access the device. We've also changed who, so the administrator account. So is there anything else we can do? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's one very, very big thing, very basic thing as well. And that is that we can also ensure that our packages are up to date because again, we need to check. I'm currently using version 7.11 RC2, which is the latest version seven build. And Microtech again recommends that you use version 7.7 .7 or version 6.49.7 and newer to address this vulnerability. So what you could do is just go into your system and packages and then just check for updates. It's typically that easy. Then you can find a new update. You can download and install the update. And here I see that I do have a new update available for my own Microtech, which I might do after this video. But this is typically how you're going to go about ensuring that your device isn't vulnerable to these attacks because firmware upgrades is typically going to address and fix the root issue so that you do not have to add these wacky rules that you need to maintain, even though you need to maintain the stuff, you need to always stay security conscious. But with this, at least we are narrowing the attack vectors. And also with the upgrade, we're ensuring that we don't have that flaw in the system anymore because the vendor has fixed the flaw for us. So yeah, that's about all that I wanted to talk to you guys about. I think I've shown you some pretty good steps at defending against vulnerabilities like this in general. And also just what the vulnerability is about or what's going on. And this is definitely not a marketing killer vulnerability where you need to jump ship because this has happened. Vulnerabilities are actually pretty common for a lot of vendors. You can use that uh, database I showed you earlier to look up any vendor that you can think of. And I can assure you all of them will have some or other vulnerability at some point in time that has been exposed or used and that it typically gets patched out. And this is actually not the worst type of vulnerability since it does require authentication. So as long as we are security conscious as administrators and we follow proper procedure by restricting the access and also just restricting the services, looking after our firewall rules properly, and also just maybe upgrading our firmware, then we're going to be in a very good and healthy situation and we don't need to stress out and worry too much about vulnerabilities like this occurring because they won't affect us. Even if the patch or the the version you're running on might be uh, susceptible to the vulnerability, as long as you properly administrate your device and set stuff like management networks, you'll be golden and you don't need to worry about these things. So anyways, I'd like to thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you soon in the next video. See ya.